nous parler de Universal Cake, une étude de cas euh, pour utiliser Web to Buy pour le développement web. Chris? Cool. Thanks. Uh, hello everybody. I'm a slight hint of the weather. I had a, uh, some major dental work yesterday. So if you see me like grimacing, it's like. <laughs> Pardon me? No, I, I, I think it would have helped a little too much. Uh, <coughs> but <laughs> thanks. Thanks, though. Uh, so, Universal Cake is something that uh, me and some friends made up uh, about 10 years ago. And um, it's, we were trying to launch a product, and it was in a, like an artist loft in Montreal. And uh, we were thinking to ourselves, you know, what kind of product do people like? And we came up with this strange concept called the Universal Cake. And the, the, basically the idea was like, it's the perfect product, you know, everybody loves it. Uh, it tastes delicious, uh, it speaks your language, uh, you know, it does whatever you want it to do. And um, so not much happened with that company, but it, it was quite fun. Uh, but that's about as far as we got. I think we did a little box, you know, it said Universal Cake on it. And, uh, but we could never decide exactly what goes in that box. Uh, that was kind of the problem. Um, but since that time, it's, it's been a great help for me uh, in uh, doing uh, software and looking for applications like that I want to use or that people want to use. And um, it's, uh, anyway, that's kind of where the, the story starts. So in the end, Universal Cake is a laundry list of qualities, good qualities that you're looking for in software, that people are looking for in software. Um, so for example, one would be uh, accessibility. Like, is this software that I could actually use? Uh, is it software that does something that I want it to do? Uh, does it work? Uh, is it in my language? Um, does it run on my computer? Do I need to worry about any of that stuff? So that's kind of the, the basic idea of behind the, the universal cake construct. Um, and it's been really helpful for me over the years in uh, identifying products that I want to invest my time and energy into. Uh, because if, if they're not headed in that universal cake direction, then you're going to end up on some side road, you know, who knows where, uh, supporting a product that you know, maybe people are still using, but it's very difficult to support because there's no community and, and everybody's moved on to this and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's an extremely helpful exercise in that way. Um, and I wanted to ask some people if, I wanted to ask you all uh, to think for just a moment, like, you know, what kind of qualities you're looking for in, when you use a software. And uh, you are the, uh, the uh, Uber users. So, but you probably have the same experience. Occasionally you'll get a piece of software and you're like, this is a piece of junk. Uh, it doesn't do what I want. Um, <clears throat> or this is totally awesome. It does exactly what I want and I don't even have to think about it. And I, I think that's kind of the, the ideal of universal cake. Can someone think of <clears throat> a software that they really, really like? Emacs. Emacs. Okay. <laughs> You are so old school. <laughs> how, many, how many people, the first thing that comes to their mind is Emacs? <laughs> okay, one. Two. Okay. I'm ashamed. I'm deeply ashamed of the basic. All right. But it works great, doesn't it? It's cross platform, it works on everything except for phones. Um, and it, it works the same everywhere. My fingers remember on every machine. Right. And uh, other softwares that people really. Yeah, it worked for this company. Clips. 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 Oh, Eclipse. Yes, that's a great example of a software that's headed in the universal cake direction. Runs on uh, all kinds of platforms. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? Amarok. Amarok, as in the music player. Right. Okay. All right. Google Wave. Google Wave. I haven't used it yet. It's one of those things I signed up for and I haven't gotten around. Is it really nice? It's awesome, except for the scroll bar. 
Okay. It's awesome design. I want to start the flame war, so I'm going to say VI. VI? Okay. VI and Vim and. And what what is it you like about VI? It's on all your Unix or. Okay. Did you have one? Right. Once you know that you maximize, maybe on the next Right. So you're. Is it okay to say something about not about open source? Yeah, sure. I like Microsoft Word. It has this white paper. Get out of here. Python. Python is like that's how I f found Python. Is like it just showed up everywhere. Like I'm relatively new to Python, and uh, it just was always there. And even though I, I used a product a, a product called Plone, which is like built on Python, uh, it was it was always there. But I never actually like did any you know Plone programming. Has anybody ever worked with Plone? Has anybody ever programmed Plone? Whoa, these guys are serious. <laughs> Is your name Dave? Dave? Oh, hey. All right. Sorry, I thought I recognized you. Um, yeah, so um, let's see. I should talk about my case. So the case is, is uh, I'm in the midst of uh, launching a new nonprofit organization. It's a nonprofit that's based on fair access, which is a, a bit difficult to define, but I think we can all think of ways that access could be fair or more fair. Um, and we have three primary areas we're working in. One is uh, fair access to technology. Um, fair access, well, let me back up just a moment. As I said, it's a very new nonprofit. Um, the three areas we work on are economic, uh, social, and political access. So, for and the three campaigns that we're starting with are access to technology via uh, accessible or highly accessible websites. And by that we mean accessible to people who are blind, but we also mean access in the bigger terms, uh, accessible to normal people, um, and. In the past, there was another nonprofit, and we're taking over their work, that provided uh, Plone hosting to a number of different nonprofit organizations. And uh, the majority of the, uh, the organizations using this Plone hosting are they're quite small. And I can't think of a single one that's actually made one change to their website. So you have these uh, tiny nonprofits running Plone. It's like a... I don't, I don't know if, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Plone is like the, the tank of content management systems. It's uh, international, it's got you know, multilingual support. It's, it's fabulous if you're like Amnesty International or the CIA, I think they use it, and, or you know, Walt Disney or something like that. It's just fabulous, fabulous product. The Department of Informatica, you can. Yeah, yeah. But it, it is big. Uh, I think uh, now it's, it's gotten a little smaller. I downloaded it today. Uh, it was 30 megs. And um, <clears throat> it's really quite hard to get your head around when you first start working with Plone. Uh, you're running on this thing called uh, Zope. How many people have heard of Zope? OK, so more than half. And these are Python people. So, Less than half, <laughs> or half, have not heard of, or less than half have not heard of Zope. Zope is, uh, yeah. Why are they choosing Plone uh, over like other content management? Uh, this is, a, it's kind of a done deal. This happened like 10 years ago. 
when Plon first came out uh, around 2000, it was the only content management system that was open source and made promises about uh, being accessible. Yeah, it, it was the old, yeah, around 2000, 2000, just to put things in perspective, like I was working at the IBM Help Center or something and for the 2000 team and we did absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you remember that, but we had a lot of free time. And so <laughs> that was right when blogging and all this kind of stuff was just taking off. And it was like for most, there, there were a few products that were before that that were commercialized, that were available, but it was totally, you know, like, oh, wow, you can edit a website, you know, on the web. Like before that, it was like FTP. So FTP, make my changes, FTP. And suddenly there was this, you know, someone was like, well, that's silly. It's a total, you know, why not just edit on, on the web? So I spent like literally hours at IBM uh, researching these different toys that people were coming up with which would allow them to uh, do live web editing, which made a lot of sense. But my criteria were, because I was in Montreal, I said, you know, I want it to be multilingual. Okay, and that wiped out like 95% of them. So, no good. And second of all, I wanted it to have some accessibility features. And that wiped out everything but Plum. <laughs> So I was not the only one doing this. There are a number of uh, nonprofit organizations that have invested heavily into Plone and the infrastructure for Plone. And it's quite big. Like I think now it's the number two open source project worldwide. Uh, and a lot of people haven't heard of it, but it, it's quite big. So back to our case study. We have 48, 47. Okay, no problem. Um, so back to our case study, we have an uh, uh, older defunct nonprofit. They have a bunch of customers that need taken care of. Uh, the customers are running Plone, which is, I don't know, about this big. And what you really need to do a website where you basically don't change anything is probably, you know, it's microscopic in comparison. And that's actually not true. I think some of the places tried to make changes, but Plone has gotten quite complex. It's, uh, it has uh, user administration um, and so on and so forth. It's got metadata and you know all the wonderful things that you would want in a, a killer uh, content management system for a, a very large organization. But for uh, your average uh, nonprofit organization, which is relatively small. It's severe overkill. Uh, and not to mention that it, it uses a lot of memory. Uh, Plone is extremely uh, memory intensive. You have this thing called the what is it, data FS, which is where all your data is stored. It's also kind of mysterious because it's running on ZOAP. Um, does anybody understand how ZOAP works? OK, we have, no, OK, he's, he's rescinding. <laughs> He's like, uh, maybe, okay, but how about uh, MySQL? Does anybody understand how that works? Yeah, okay, no problem. But Zope is like this big, like mysterious thing, and uh, we have this huge uh, content management system built on top of Zope. Plone is actually like a, a product, and I, I think under there, there's another uh, content management system that Plone is built up on top of, so it's just, it's a very large stack, and it's been around for a long time. I love it. I, I use it all the time. It's awesome if you want to, uh, if you need to keep track of a bunch of uh, miscellaneous uh, technical data for an organization that's not very organized. You can use it just like your own private Google. So you just plug stuff in there, cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste. Uh, and then there's a nice this little search box, which almost nobody uses in the upper right-hand corner. But it works, it works uh, sort of like the uh, Mac Spotlight. So you just type in uh, Bob's speech. You know, and it pulls it up for you, just like magic. So it's, it's awesome for that kind of stuff. 
Uh, it's also great if you are a really big uh, nonprofit organization that supports uh, multilingual supporters all over the world. <coughs> Excellent for that. And uh, there's tons of uh, support, very, very large community uh, available for it. Um, but very difficult to upgrade. And I've, I've done a few clone upgrades, and it's quite tricky uh, if you've customized it at all. Uh, then it becomes even more tricky. Uh, and it's, it's surprisingly easy to do certain customizations. Like you can create, uh, I think they're called archetypes. You can create a new sort of content type, uh, relatively easy. But you can get into trouble with that pretty quickly if it's been a few years and the guy who did the original one and did those little tweaks is gone. So obviously, uh, it's not something that a, a small nonprofit organization wants to be maintaining for a whole bunch of other nonprofit organizations. Uh, does anybody, anyone have any comments on Plon or questions about Plon? Okay, great. Uh, so, yes, oh, let this be a lesson. If you have a MacBook, you need to bring that adapter dongle. Uh, Uh, ah, so we talked a bit about uh, universal cake, the laundry list. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read it really quickly, because I do indeed have a laundry list. Uh, uh, yeah, so number one, <clears throat> to, to create a piece of uh, universal cake, you want something that's accessible. So it's easy for everyone to use. Uh, it's available in the language of your choice, affordable or free, uh, culturally relevant. Uh, it needs to be compatible. So it runs on many devices. So it runs on my iPhone, it runs on my, my laptop, it runs on Windows, it runs on OS X. Uh, ex remember, we're talking about idealism here, like what we'd like versus what we're going to get. Uh, but <coughs> But we have no chance of getting this unless this is somewhere in our head. Um, so uh, yeah, it runs on Windows, Unix, BSD, FreeBSD, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's fast and lightweight, so it doesn't take up all your CPU. Uh, there's no extra junk. It's uh, slimware as opposed to, say, bloatware. It has longevity, so it's going to be around next week or next year. Uh, which Plone has been around for a long time, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it, uh, oh, I added a new one the other day, input, output, universality. Whoa. So, so that means you can put in speech or you can put in text or whatever, and you can output speech or you can output text. So like I said, this is our dream piece of software, but if it's not up there somewhere, it will not happen. Uh, it's non-intrusive, so it protects your privacy. Uh, it doesn't leave any traces. It's easy, easily uninstalled. Um, it's uh, transparent in that it's uh, open source, or at least you can fix a bug. You know, if there's a bug. Um, <clears throat> secure, which I sort of covered with uh, the other part, but uh, so it's safe to use. Secure updates or security updates are readily available, and so on and so forth. Doesn't interfere with your OS or other software. I covered that one. Uh, reviewable, as in open source again. Uh, it's supported, so there's good community <coughs> and user support. So there's support for developers, support for a, a community of users. Uh, we're pretty sure it's going to be around for a while. Good developer support over the long term. Uh, mm, and it builds on other products that will be around for a while. I added that when I was thinking about Plo, and I thought I'll just stick that in there. Um, it's reliable. It's backwards compatible. Uh, that's a big one, backwards compatible. Uh, it's easy to upgrade. And finally, it's useful. <laughs> so, so that's our uh, laundry list we're using uh, to, for comparison, which is relatively idealistic, but a lot of things on that have uh, come true over the years. A lot of, uh, and Eclipse is a great example. You can run that on, I run it on 
you know, uh, Ubuntu and uh, OS X, and I don't really use Windows too much, uh, so I haven't installed Eclipse on that, but I think it runs on Windows too. Yeah, so it's pretty damn awesome. And an uh, off, awful lot of Python products. Okay, Web to Pi. <clears throat> the first time I went to the Web to Pi site, <clears throat> I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> it's a laundry list. It's the same kind of laundry list that I have. But uh, what is Web to Pi? Yeah. Web to Pi is, uh, I think on the website they call it an enterprise uh, app web application framework. Um, I call it like a web application framework. So it, it's, a, it's a written in uh, Python. And uh, I'm sure it'd be fine f for using in the enterprise, but I, I find that kind of scares people away. It's like, uh, it's some IBM product that's like <laughs> 10 miles wide. But uh, it's pretty, it's, it's microscopic. Uh, I think it's less than a meg. And, um, pardon me? It cannot be enterprise. No? <laughs> yes, it's too small to be in the enterprise. But, uh, I, I believe there are some enterprises using it. Uh, but I, I, th I think of it more as a, a, a web application framework. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I know there are some enterprises enterprises using it. Uh, so basically, here we go. Uh, so it's open source. Uh, it supports uh, agile development. It's very easy to spit out a, a, an update. Uh, it's scalable, uh, secure, portable, uh, it's Python. Uh, the resources are a bit scattered, but they're uh, definitely excellent. Uh, and uh, it's the guy who started the project, um, Massimo. Massimo seems to like be able to read everybody's mind. So, so one week you'll be thinking, you know, I really wish I could, uh, you know, index my database by UUIDs, right? And then, sure enough, next week, you know, Massimo's like on Vimo or uh, YouTube or something like that. It's like how to. You know, convert your web to Pi application to use UUIDs and export it to you know another database. And you're like, okay, whatever. But uh, constant that kind of thing is constantly happening. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, oh yeah, par pardon me. Back to our laundry list. Uh, it's backwards compatible, and uh, he says it's going to remain that way forever. And in fact, he says we pledge not to break it in the future. So he said, we have not broken backwards compatibility since version 1.0 in 2007. Uh, we pledge not to break it in the future. Easy to run. Requires no installation and no configuration. And you can imagine my disappointment when I went to all this work to like set up Eclipse on my older MacBook. You know, I got it all running, and I got the, the Git thing going, and all this other stuff going. I was like, yeah. And, uh, not required for web to pi because it comes with its own little IDE editor. And uh, so, <laughs> and uh, not only that, there, there really is no configuration to get it up and running. So pretty cool. I was a little scared at first because it seemed just a little bit too, um, it, it met too many, the advertisements met too many of my specifications in Universal Cake. And being the creator of Universal Cake, I know that Universal Cake is outrageous. It's an outrageous proposition. Uh, so I was kind of shocked with that. Uh, it includes uh, internationalization support through the famous T, which I'm sure everybody's aware of. The famous T? No? Uh, T. Uh, brace. No? Oh, OK. All right. You should look into the T. Does anybody else know the T? Hmm? <laughs> you know the T? Can you show us and show us what you mean on the block? Yeah, let's OK. You mean get the I don't know. I mean, maybe. Uh... Okay. I don't know why you didn't use it. Oh, 
sorry. Oh, so. With a T. That's what I call it. Like I said, I'm new to Python, so I'm going to be making a lot of mistakes. So if, if, I, if I give you any technical information about Python, just cross it right off your list of things to remember. Uh, <clears throat> right, uh, easy to run, so it requires no installation and configuration. Secure, it includes uh, SSL-enabled uh, web server, uh, which I believe is, uh, what is that, Cherry Pie? Uh, bells and whistles galore. It's like streaming capable, web server, web-based integrated development environment, and web-based management interface, which basically means you can you can uh, access your your database. It, it generates a web page so that you can access your tables and your your database. You can actually make changes in there. It only it will only let you log on if you have a secure connection or if you're running on the local host. So it's, it's quite fabulous in, the, in that area. The last big uh, web project I worked on was with uh, another programming language. <coughs> um, and we didn't have that ability. So we had to use some slightly insecure way of uh, some administrative tool that was slightly insecure at the time to uh, edit our databases. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, so it's very flexible. You can use uh, multiple authentication methods, uh, and it includes uh, role-based access controls. Uh, it's fast. Uh, it's tiny. There's a whole bunch of uh, mul it says multiple caching methods for scalability. That sounds good. Uh, good community. It uses a jQuery. Uh, library for uh, Ajax and effects. Anybody use that? Okay. Ah, I'm learning so much. All right. Um, web servers, it, it will run under Apache, uh, Lite, TPD, Cherokee, and uh, almost any other web, web server, including WSGI, which we saw our presentation earlier tonight, uh, Mod Proxy, Mod Python. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, database support is a little shocking too. And uh, this is another reason why I did not believe when I visited the site. Uh, it comes with SQLite. So that's why you don't have to configure anything because it's already configured to use SQLite. You just type away if you know what you're doing, which takes a little while to figure out, by the way. Uh, so that works great. You can use Posgre if you want. You can use, uh, did I pronounce that right? Nobody knows. Posgre, Posgre. Uh, MySQL, uh, MSSQL, Firebird, Oracle, IBM DB2, Informix, Ingus, and uh, Google App Engine. Uh, it's flexible. Uh, you can, it can embed third-party WSGI apps and middleware, which we uh, it's secure, prevents the most common types of vulnerability. Uh, it protects against cross-site cross scripting, uh, injection flaws. Uh, that's my personal favorite thing to do when I'm debugging people's websites, or supposedly debugging, but messing them up to show them where their problems are. Uh, and it also does... Um, Malicious file execution. So if someone uploads a you know a tainted JPEG and it's actually a program that says you know R M minus R or something, then that doesn't work for them. So that's all included. Uh, sheesh, do I need to go on? Uh, it enforces uh, best practices. So it uses the MVC or Model View Controller design. Uh, does server-side form validation, uh, postbacks, uh, speaks multiple protocols. This was another big shocker for me because the last project I worked on, we had to do uh, XML RPC, which was cool, um, but it was kind of hard. And, uh, but it comes out of the box. It's got it, and uh, you can write, like, I don't know, 10 lines or something, and 
spit your database out to some other website somewhere else or do whatever you need to do. It's totally awesome. Uh, so that's their laundry list of the reasons why Web2Pi is great. So I decided that needed the further investigation. No? Sounds pretty damn good. Uh, oh, I cursed again. It's like <laughs> three times. Um, Plone, I love Plone. I think I said that already. Uh, development tools, none required. Uh, if if you want to develop Web to Pi itself, you you can you know of course use Eclipse and that sort of thing. Uh, I recently stumbled upon something called Aptana Studio. Does anybody else use that? Evil commercial freeware, but uh, it was really easy to set up. I don't know if you've uh, ever. T if it's ever taken you a while to uh, set up uh, Eclipse, uh, that was really easy, and it in it installed jQuery and Dojo and uh, Yahoo user interface and all the cool bells and whistles in like one click, I believe, or okay, ten or fifteen clicks. But uh, it was much easier than the the standard uh, Eclipse configuration. Um, but you don't really need that. You, you can edit it uh, live uh, locally using the built-in IDE. Uh, there's also a built-in ticketing system, which uh, as a person with slightly dyslexic tendencies, I take full advantage of. Uh, so if you make a typo or whatever, it, it tells you right away. It says, like, dude, you messed up. Go back and you know, move that period. and or replace that comma with a period. That seems to be my favorite error. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, Accessibility-wise, they make zero claims accessibility-wise. And uh, Plone used to make some, you know, when you went to their website, the one of the first things they said was, we're going to be accessible and we're going to be, in, you know, they kind of dropped that. Uh, Web2Pi says nothing about that at all. Uh, but as far as I can tell, it's uh, very easy to implement. Uh, once you get through all the uh, flack around accessibility, uh, has anybody done any research on that and gotten frustrated? No? Yeah. If you start to do some research on accessibility, it's, it's, uh, it gets really boring really fast. Uh, uh, there, there are all kinds of, you know, fabulous plans, um, and so on and so forth. But it's very hard to find, like, OK, just show me the code. How do I do it? Like, what do I need to do? And so it's very hard, difficult to find that. That's gotten a lot better, but you have to go through all these, you know, uh, we'll just say, conf well, I'll call it conflicting information. Uh, but um, now a lot of the uh, JavaScript uh, things I had mentioned earlier, like jQuery and uh, Yahoo, uh, those guys are putting that into their, their code. So you don't even have to do the work. You can just plug into their stuff. Uh, that's probably the thing I like the most about Web2Pi is I don't have to do any work. Uh, it's all done. Uh, you can. And I'm lying here, of course, right? There's abs absolutely, there's a lot of work to do uh, to understand exactly what's going on uh, because it's uh, extremely um, concise. Like, uh, the, the, one of the nicest things I like about it is that uh, the way Web2Pi is built is you, you can, you know, create forms from scratch using Python. And uh, you, you, it runs with Python. Uh, it does it a little bit peculiarly in that um, it uses the double brace. So you put your code in a double brace. Uh, you have the uh, controller. Uh, all right, who knows what the uh, controller model view is? All right, that's good. That's good. All right. So uh, basically, if you want to create a database, you 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 do your um, you know like table name, uh, field number one, blah. Uh, field number two, blah blah blah, et cetera et cetera. Then you have your table. 
uh, in the uh, database file at the very top, you'll put something like, you know, I want to put the, I want to run on SQLite because I'm running locally. Well, then tomorrow you need to deploy it. So you don't have to do anything. <clears throat> Be if you want to deploy it on the Google App Engine, because there's already this little if thing that somebody put in there, and it says, well, if I'm on Google App Engine, run on Google App Engine. And then you're fine, unless you created a database that has some complex joins or other things that aren't compatible with Google. So I'm lying when I say there's no work involved. The work involved, there is definitely work involved. And you, you would want, if you want to check it out and use it in earnest, you'll want to buy the manual, which is $12, uh, a great deal. Even just to check it out, it's a great deal. Um, and there's uh, excellent support. The best site for support, I think, is, uh, or I should say for applications, because the other cool thing about WebDepy is you've got WebDepy here, which is a open, you know, it's a open source application, and then you have your web app here, and it's basically you can export it to a single file, it's sort of like a zip file, and then you can email it to your buddy because it's only going to be like I don't know 700k, you know, unless you got some pictures in there, and it'll be a lot bigger. Then you can email it to your friend, and uh, he can run it, or he can load it on his server, or whatever. So, it's, so there's this separation, very clear separation between the app, the web application, you know, development platform, and which is 700k, and the uh, the web application that you're spitting out. Um, you so you can use this. You can make this closed source, which is not going to be interesting for everybody, but it is going to be interesting for some people. So, and then what you do is there's a little button here. You can choose export or compact, or uh, you can choose what do they call the bytecode of Python. Yeah, create bytecode. So then you spit out your file, but instead of being like text, it's Python bytecode which means at least somebody's going to have to break the law if they want to steal your web app, your precious, precious web application. So that's, <laughs> sorry, too many jokes. Um, <clears throat> so that is really cool. Um, the other cool thing is, is because it's so easy to spit out web applications, is what you're going to discover if you, you start exploring it is like suddenly you're going to have like 20 different crazy web applications. You're going to want to download, you know, uh, Massimo's um, screen scraper application that scrapes the Chicago transit schedules and then tells you, you know, which bus to take at 11 o'clock, because that's pretty cool. And uh, since it's open source, you can go in there and see exactly how Massimo did it. Uh, and then you can, you can either, so if you're doing one for Montreal, very, very helpful. Uh, you can look at his uh, crazy uh, stock price prediction thing and you know make a fortune, uh, and you can see how he he did it. So it's very very helpful from that point of view. Um, the other great thing is that people kind of pass them around all the time. There's not that many that are uh, international right now. They did the uh, I think you were talking about the the uh, Python. Website for PyCon was it PyCon? Uh, PyCon is right on Django. Uh, I think it's Django. I, I missed the read. Uh, PyCon is the main site is running in Django. Okay. But the registration site is still ah, the registration. Five. Right. It was built by Massimo and Guy Niarco. Right. So Mas Massimo and Yarko did the registration site. If you look at that, you'll see like a first crack at a. Well, actually, it's not really the first crack, but maybe the second or third crack at an international application. So a really hard job to take on uh, on, a, on a relatively young, I think it's like two, three years old, web to pi. Uh, but you can, you, can go, you can look at the code, see how they did the whole thing, and see why sometimes, you know, Yarko is like a... <laughs> 
but uh, they so it's awesome in that way. Uh, recently, I've been like complaining a lot about internationalization on the, the webmail, and uh, so Massimo did uh, another one of his famous videos, which is like you know having a multilingual website in three minutes. So he does a lot of those things. Uh, questions? All right. And I, I tend to get a bit uh, monotone after a little while. I have a question. Yes. So you tried this. Uh, you have a demo application we can look at or? Uh, sure. Uh, if uh, there's one at uh, <coughs> myvishpala dot, uh, what is it, appspot dot com. Let me just check the URL. And, like, uh, oh, actually, I can show you one. It could be kind of far away. I don't know you that well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have Plone there for folks who haven't seen Plone. It's a awesome software, but it's it's kind of a army tank. Uh, actually, it's more like a battleship. And uh, this is a. I'm just going to change pages on my Plone there. So you saw there was like kind of a little delay there, and I'm going to go over to uh, Web Depuy. Oh. Asking for my administrator's password. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, you have a default application uh, for folks who've used Ruby on Rails. It works very much like uh, the concepts are very similar to Ruby on Rails. You have a, a skeleton or a scaffolding. Sorry. Uh, and uh, the scaffolding in the case of WebDepy, I believe, is the welcome application. So if, if you're like really kicking out the websites, uh, you would probably want to customize uh, the welcome application because every new application that you create, and uh, I'll just create a new application. That would be exciting. So I'm going to go to a site, uh, create new application. And I'm going to call it the letter A, and I choose submit, and now I have my new application. So, yeah. Are they all WSGI applications? Is it a WSGI-based framework? Uh, the framework runs under any, well, all, not any, but most web servers. Yeah, all right. The, the, from my understanding of WSGI, it's not new, but uh, support is kind of new. Um, they, they use a mod uh, WSGI, and I've run it under mod uh, WSGI on uh, Ubuntu and worked great. I had to uh, change one of the um, configuration files that was a little that's supposed to work on uh, mod WSGI but doesn't actually work. So I just had to change the in the virtual host file there was uh, I'm trying to remember the name. It was like a variable for the group that was running uh, mod WSGI. Um, wow, I'm like parched. Uh, okay, so we have our application, and uh, I have a whole whack of other applications. I'll just open one that looks nice. Uh, uh, mine are all very. Okay, I have the uh, WebDepy conference application. Whoops, internal error. Now, it comes with uh, ticketing, so it's issued a ticket because I have an internal error. I'm going to click on it, and it's going to tell me all my information. And uh, this is all running on my uh, web browser. So it tells me where the error is. It says, uh, got an unexpected unexpe keyword argument, pools. Well, I've I've haven't run into I haven't actually explored that particular as aspect. Yeah, um, most, most frameworks would say, well, when it's in this is development, it will give you an error message and you can debug. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's in production, it will send you an email like uh, Django does. 
Sure, you can. I'm or, or tickets, uh, for example. But I was just kind of reading quickly, and mm -hmm. I was asking the, the thing will generate a ticket in both modes. So in development, you have the resilience of error by, by definition. Yeah, 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 just one after the other. So in that case, you have a, a bunch of messages. I'm just curious if the insertion with them, or does it come with built in Google? Uh, what the client looks like? Does that be uh, it, you can get an application that does that. WebPy itself, uh, I don't believe, has a search function for the errors. But uh, I'm just going to go here. There's a errors tab, which I never use. Uh, uh, click on it. It says error logs for A. I have zero. Uh, let me just go back to that last application where we got our error. Uh, uh, hold on. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, there we go. So we have our error. I'm going to click on it. Now I'm going to click on errors. This will show me the errors for this application. So when I was under the other, the new application that I created, since it's brand new, no errors. Uh, now I'm under this application called WebConf, and I have two errors that I've generated because I loaded the page twice. Uh, we have a date and time stamp. Uh, I can delete them if I want, or I can click on them and uh, follow up. So it's, uh, it's really unbelievable. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, I did not believe the advertising at all when I went to the site, but it's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you can you can uh, visit uh, web to pi uh, As I said, the the resources are kind of scattered, and there's a few abandoned you know support sites and that kind of stuff that you'll run into, which uh, look kind of bad. Uh, but uh, a great one to check out is called web to pi Slices for those of you who uh, like speed and agility and want to see all the latest bells and whistles. Uh, web to pi Slices is kind of where you can uh, paste, you know, like how to install it, uh, paste an Ubuntu installer script for uh, web to pi So if, if, if you're looking for that kind of like speedy, you know, shortcuts to development, you would go to web to pi slices, and if you're running Ubuntu, you would look up uh, the script that uh, Massimo wrote, uh, <laughs> uh, which basically does your standard uh, Ubuntu apt get and uh, installs and configures web to pi for you. Um, as I wrote in the little email I sent out today for folks who saw it, um, like I was, did, did anybody else go to this? Uh, Google, uh, there was a Google guy who was giving a talk on um, uh, Google Application Engine and how to use that. It was a while. How, how was that? Uh, it was a little light on the detail, I thought. Okay, and how long, how long was it? Ah, uh, okay. I was just wondering how, how long it was because like I, I uh, wanted to you know try deploying my application on the Google App Engine and I'm, you know it was kind of scary right I was like oh, Google App Engine and uh, I was like I, I better study you know before I go to this conference so I know what I'm talking about you know at least I can ask an intelligent question and so I was like I'll just go through the steps of you know deploying my uh, little test application and uh, so I. You know, before I knew it, it was just deployed. And I was like, well, OK. That was really easy. It was really, really easy. And I, I had to uh, edit the uh, YAML file, I think, uh, Y-A-M-L file. But uh, after that, just poof, it was up there. 
And uh, then I was a little bit sad because <laughs> there was some more stuff I wanted to do on my app and make it look pretty. But the great thing was is it forced me to iterate. And uh, for those of you who've been in the business a while, like if you're not, you know, doing your iterations, then uh, you're like polishing your gem all the time. Then that that can really interfere with you know business processes and. It uh, makes it even harder when you finally get around to like spitting out your application or whatever to, to do it. So I thought that was, that was actually the thing I, I've, I found to be the most wonderful about it is that uh, because it's so easy to uh, upgrade and update, um, <clears throat> I feel very comfortable with you know, pushing something out that's a little funky for my test users. And uh, so the site that I have up, uh, my vish. Does anybody have an internet connection? Yeah. Okay, it's a uh, <clears throat> myvishpala. Dot, is it appspot.com? I think. It is appspot. Yeah, appspot.com. And uh, vishpala. Oh, sorry, that's a. Uh, So it's <clears throat> it's a uh, first. It's like a pre. It's like an accidental <laughs> uh, Google deployment, but I, I really like it. And uh, it allowed uh, some of our users to get on there and test it right away. We had uh, we have one uh, blind user that I was uh, especially concerned about, and uh, he was able to successfully log on and uh, navigate, which is why the the menus are a little bit, uh, well, they're text menus, the ones that I did. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, because it was kind of an accidental release, uh, I, I didn't uh, configure any you know, email server or anything like that. So sure enough, he forgot his password. And when he clicked on you know, recover password, it didn't work. Uh, but other, other than that, he was able to uh, edit, uh, make some changes. And I, I based the whole thing on this uh, how to deploy a, a web app on uh, GAE in three minutes by uh, Massimo, uh, which is, of course is insane as far as a, a claim. Uh, and I, I think someone was complaining that he actually took four minutes to deploy his application. Uh, and he didn't include the you know, clicking the deploy now part in his, his video. And, uh, but uh, it was a pretty great application, and it's it's based on I, I forget the name of the guy who actually first conceptualized it, but uh, based on the uh, concept of uh, rather than editing content, what you do is you make a copy of your content, and then you create a new page, and you paste the old content in the new page, so that nothing ever gets deleted. And uh, it's it's a fantastic concept because you know uh, space is really really cheap these days, and it gives you a big level of transparency. Uh, it's totally awesome for people who can't see because they're always hitting the wrong buttons and and uh, having problems. So the, they're not afraid to do uh, content editing because they know even if they you know explode the entire page, that they can always go back in history and uh, pull up their, their old pages. Uh, it's also great for if you're doing anything in the United States where they have uh, these incredibly, uh, I don't know what the, the punishments are, but uh, nobody talks about cheating. Uh, but you have to keep track of your history. And uh, so Plone is very good about that. Plone has a, you can go back in history of web pages that get edited. and. Uh, see what Bob did you know, 10 months ago uh, that the IRS is interested in, if, if you're American. And uh, they have very strict, uh, strict law now. What is it, the Sarbanes-Oxley's Act? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's actually laws, and they're passed through the Congress. So they become 
company has to keep records after 10 years. Yes, yes, thank you. 10 years. Uh, and I, so for companies that have websites, or if you're in the website making business and you want to sell all these Etats Unis, uh, it's uh, something you really want to be uh, aware of. Uh, Sarbanes, Oxley, and uh, so this little test app I did, I, I liked Massimo's implementation. It's like super lightweight and uh, super simple, perhaps a little too simple. Um, definitely needs some expansion, but it also included a little wiki, uh, so wiki uh, functionality, I should say, so that uh, users can easily create a new web page. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's it's hopeless. How, for example, how did you make your, your little your app um, accessible? That's a great question, and uh, that was a huge uh, thing that I decided not to cover because it uh, people get bummed out. I don't know. I need to think about. It. Oh, poor guy can't see. And people get bummed out. But uh, it's uh, in a nutshell. Uh, for menu items, um, you, wanna, you, you, you want you uh, you want nice degrading. So the 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 secret is uh, degrading, uh, which means that uh, if you're using some fancy new you know Java application, what happens when it's running on you know Windows Explorer five, which is what all the blind people are running because they're poor. Uh, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I'm just kidding. But that's something to keep in mind. But that seriously, that's <laughs> okay. Too many jokes. Uh, because statistically, if you take a look at a uh, population of individuals living with disabilities, like blindness, the nine times out of ten, uh, well, actually, maybe it's a little less than that. But they're unemployed, uh, so they have no money. Um, and uh, they're going to be running the oldest stuff that will run. And uh, so <clears throat> that's something you want to keep in mind. Uh, the, the other thing you want to keep in mind is that there's also a lot of uh, flack around uh, accessibility. Flack meaning um, conflicting stories. So you'll go to one place and there'll be a piece of Canadian research saying, you know, never ever use uh, access keys. Right, those are like the hot keys. Never use those because users of certain uh, screen scrapers slash screen readers readers will uh, be using the same keyboard combinations, and, and so it gets very scary really quickly. But the best thing you do is you put it out. Can you log on? Yeah. Did you have a problem? No, it works great. Fantastic. Uh, pardon me. Links, well, links is awesome because it's it's uh, for, light. yeah, it's light. It's from the command line. It's a bit dated, I think. Well, most most there there are a few uh, exceptional um, uh, blind programmers uh, and command line users. And in fact, there's a there's a product for Emacs called uh, Emacs Speaks which was recently inducted into the Smithsonian Museum because uh, it's so awesome, uh, that allows uh, blind users to do uh, Emacs programming, uh, which is actually another reason why WebDepy is much more fun to program with. And I almost left it out, and I only have one minute. Oh my god. There's a shell in uh, WebDepy. So and it, it runs over the. Um, you can tell I'm kind of a wuss because uh, I don't use the shell in Web2Pi. But uh, Massimo uses it all the time. Uh, so you have shell access. And uh, the other cool thing about it is uh, unlike uh, Plone, which uses the ZMI, which is cool, um, it runs uh, right on the file system of the web server. So you, know, you can do synchronization and all this other Cool stuff. Uh, very, very easily. You can, you know, swap files in, swap files out. Uh, the other great thing about it is you can uh, 
export your application, as I said before, send it to a friend. Uh, you can uh, you know, look at your ticketings, ticketing, see what work a programmer has done during the day if you're in administration, uh, and so on and so forth. It's, it's fabulous. Yeah? Scott, maybe how well does it scale? If you want to do your application at one point of time out here in Anakin City or up to the Pacific of the year, is it easy? On, uh, I've never tried to scale web to Pi. Uh, you can on web to pi slices uh, Massimo again talks about you know how to scale your web to pi uh, server oh, I believe I'm out of time uh, and uh, uh, Massimo is kind of like following uh, someone through like the jungle and who 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 lives there because he knows he's like he is so good at, at using web to pi that sometimes it's kind of hard to follow him but but um yeah he's got a he's done a, a slice on how to do uh, scalability uh and uh, finally in closing i just wanted to say the other the thing that i like the most about web to pi is that it includes things like uh crud uh has anybody used crud before okay crud is like automated uh it uh, does a creates an automated web page uh, for your database. So with your fields and your data, auto automatically. And I'm I'm sure there are like some other things that do that as well. So you can use CRUD, uh, which works great, uh, or you can go really low level. And most of the web pi is basically finished now. What uh, they do is um, they add layers which you can choose to use or not to use. And uh, those layers are called, uh, there's one is T2 and T3 and T4. And those are the ones that you, you don't, yeah, not that T, a different T. Uh, so T2, T3, and T4, most web Pi users, I think, never even visit that. But that's where your eyes like, you know, whoa, I'm going to stay up all night and make this work. This is so cool. Uh, so, so, so if you want to uh, play uh, uh, with web to pi, you can work on the layers, and you don't have to worry about killing everybody's applications. Um, uh, who, you know, all these organizations that built their application on uh, web to pi. So it's super easy to upgrade. You can upgrade to the next version, and it doesn't wipe out your applications. I tried to reinstall Plone today, and uh, it said you already have Plone installed. Please erase it before you, you know, reinstall. Just f out of fear that they might somehow like clobber my application, which was really polite. But you don't need to worry about that with Web to Pi because of the way it's it's uh, laid out. So you can do upgrades. Thank thank you very much. I'm sorry it was slightly disjointed. I w I wanted to do this uh, a little bit later, but uh, Yannick had an opening for the main spot, so. I went for it, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, if you have questions or whatever, more than happy to uh, give you my my best answers. Thank you, Riz.